So if we can keep our Bibles open at Luke chapter 24, uh, we're going to be in this passage. uh, That's what we're going to be looking at today. Two friends were walking through a park. And as they walked through a park, they started talking, as you do. And they started talking about the weather, about how it was nice today, but it looked like it would rain tomorrow. They started talking about the different animals around them. And before long, they found that their conversation had turned to Christianity. It had turned to Jesus. You see, one of them, one of the friends, was a believer. But the other was not. And the conversation turned to Christian things. And as the Christian was explaining about their faith, about why they believed, the non-Christian turned around and said, it's all unprovable. You can't prove any of it. There's no way you can test it. So how can you know? You can never know. The non-Christian said, well, it's good for you. You can believe it if it helps you. But you can never prove it. So why does it matter to me? Why should I care? I wonder what should the Christian say? What could the Christian say? Well, this, if you like, is the testing point of the Christian faith, the resurrection. Because either it happened or it didn't. Either it's historical fact or it's not. It's one or the other. And you see, this is something the Bible even brings out. Paul brings it out a lot in 1 Corinthians 15. He says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. That's what Paul says himself. But then the counter of that is, if Christ is risen, if Christ did rise from the dead, then Christians have a hope. In fact, they have the only hope because no one else has risen from the dead as Christ did. So this is a point where Christianity can be tested. Jesus went around and he offered people life. He talked about people having eternal life through believing in him. But if he's dead and he's still in his grave, well, that's a pretty empty promise because if he doesn't have eternal life, well, how can he offer it to you? But the Christian claim and what the Bible claims and what we know as Christians to be true is that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That on that Easter Sunday that we're now commemorating today, Jesus did rise from the grave. This is the testing point, if you like, for Christianity. If it's true, then that should change everybody's life. That should stop everybody's life and make them think, what is the answer? Because each of us will one day sadly face a grave. And that is hope in the light of grave, a real hope, an evidence-based hope. If it's not true, then I guess we'd all be foolish for being here. But we as Christians can be sure that it is true. Matthew 12, verse 39 to 40 reads, with Jesus answering some people that are coming to him, he says, he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a whale, of a great fish, uh, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. See, this is the sign that Jesus gave. The sign that he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and then he would rise up. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish, and then was spewed out. This is the sign, this is the point where you can test Christianity. Is it true or is it not? We're going to look at three things this morning. We're going to look at the disciples. We're going to look at the evidence. And we're going to look at Jesus. Because as Christians, um, I'm sure a lot of people here will have grown up in Christian homes and will have heard this story countless times. They'll have read about the resurrection countless times. And so it's easy to uh, gloss over or to miss details and pieces within this. And in studying this passage, I've been surprised by all the bits that I've glossed over and I've missed as I read through. So we're going to look at the disciples first, then we're going to look at evidence, and then we're going to look at Jesus. So firstly, the disciples. 
And the disciples are a bit strange in this passage. They're probably not the people you're expecting them to be. Do you know the disciples in this passage are very cynical? Do you know the disciples in this passage are very scared? They're a far cry from what we see in Acts, where we see these bold uh, evangelists going out loud and sharing the gospel with everyone they meet. Here, they're quite cynical and they're scared. You see, we can tell they're scared because in other accounts, this, uh, this passage, this event, this um, seeing Jesus Christ risen from the dead, this event is recorded in the other Gospels as well. And from John's Gospel, chapter 20, we know that uh, from the same account of this story, that the doors were locked. In fact, John says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said, peace be to you. See, the doors were locked on that room that they were gathered in. Why were the doors locked? Because they were afraid. They've just seen Jesus taken by force and crucified, and they're scared that's going to happen to them. They're not gladly throwing their lives behind the cause and risking their lives. No, they'd run away. They deserted Jesus. And now, even now that they've deserted Jesus, they're still, still scared that people are going to come looking for them. That's why they're locked away in a room, gathered together, hiding. Not only that, but they're probably scared in another way as well. Because if you think about it, if Jesus Christ isn't risen, then they're scared of the Jewish people who, in this case, have just killed uh, Christ. Um, the Pharisees particularly that have led um, Jesus to the cross. It's because it says here they're uh, for fear of the Jews. That's why they've locked the room. But they're also probably afraid if Jesus is risen from the dead. You see, if Jesus has risen from the dead, well, they've all just betrayed him. They've all just gone their own way and deserted him. So either way round, these people who made great statements of loyalty to Christ have deserted him. And so they're afraid even if he is risen from the dead, even if his words are true and he rises. Because then they in Matthew 26, Peter said to Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I'll not deny you. And actually all the disciples said the same as well. We see in that passage. So either way, they'll be frightened. I also want to point out that they were cynical. So this was actually, this is on Easter Sunday, that first Easter Sunday. And it's actually the fifth appearance of Jesus on that day. He's appeared to Mary Magdalene. He's appeared to the women. He's appeared to Peter. And he's appeared to two disciples on their way to Emmaus as well. And now, the fifth one, he's appearing to the disciples as a group. But at, by this point, all those people had came back and had shared the story of meeting J Jesus risen from the dead. They'd heard all these reports. They'd heard them all, and yet they still hadn't believed. And we see that from Mark, actually, where Mark's recording the same events. And Mark records it as, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. You see, they were reluctant, they were cynical. They had heard the evidence, they'd heard Peter, they'd heard Mary, they'd heard the two disciples on the Emmaus Road come back and say, he's risen, I've met him, he's risen, he's risen. And yet they did not believe. You see, these are not by nature gullible fishermen who would believe anything. They're by nature very cynical people. They're, they want evidence. That's what I mean by that. They want to know that there is evidence that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. And actually, a lot of the evidence that is coming to them, they discount as not good enough. The eyewitnesses, the four, four different groups who came back, they discounted them. And as you see in this passage, they're continuously discounting the evidence when they see Jesus risen from the dead. They want more evidence. They want more. You see, this will happen all the way up until Jesus ascends. Because even at the ascension in Matthew chapter 28, just before the Great Commission is given out, even then we read, when they saw him, the they worshipped him. So this is the disciples. They worshipped Jesus, but some doubted. 
So this doubting is going to carry on all the way up until that ascension. So my question to you is, do you really believe the resurrection? Do you really believe what we celebrate as Christians at Easter? Do you really believe it happened? You see, there was a survey done, and it's a really sad survey in a way. It was done in April 2017, and it was done in Britain, right here. And they asked people, are you a Christian? And out of the people who said yes to being a Christian, so self-described as Christians, they asked, do you really believe the resurrection of Jesus? How many people do you think? How many people said they really believed Jesus' resurrection as it was written in the Bible? The answer is 31%, that's less than half, of people who self-described as Christians actually believed the Bible's account of the resurrection. Now that's shocking, but it's, a, it's an evidence that they found there. Do you know, we can have confidence. Why? Because the disciples were people who needed evidence as well. So when they went looking for evidence, when they went looking for it, they also recorded it. And actually that's an amazing thing because they doubted, because they looked for the evidence around them. That means we actually have amazing evidence recorded for us. Because we can look through this passage and as we will come on to the evidences in the passage, we can say Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead. Because in a way of the disciples' cynicism, because they were reluctant to accept it themselves. And we can know that the disciples' recording is true because they go on to die for this message. These are the people who are scared and who are terrified and hiding in a room. They are afraid of punishment. They're afraid of suffering. But yet, yet they will go on to suffer and die for this message. All bar one of them. And the last one will suffer horribly. He just won't happen to actually die from that. So all the other um, ten of those disciples there will die horribly, uh, violently for this message, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, and the other one will suffer heavily for it. So if this is you today, if you're one of those 69%, if you're one of those who are unsure of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, let me tell you, we can rely on this message. This is where we have our hope as Christians. This is where we can take our stand as Christians. And when people ask you, what's the evidence for your faith? This is actually the point you can turn to and say there's plenty of evidence. Jesus Christ is alive. He's risen. Those over 500 people who saw him risen from the dead, they weren't lying to us. Jesus Christ is alive. So secondly, let's look at the evidence. Let's look at the different things that are in this passage that change the disciples from um, quite cowardly hiding in a room to outspoken evangelists. Let's look at the evidence that in front of them. So firstly, Christ enters a closed room. The room's locked. That's a miracle in itself. Christ just enters it. And he stands in the midst, in the middle of them. They're all gathered around the outside. They'll be able to see his every move. He stood in the middle of the room. So they can see every angle. There's no puppet strings. There's no pieces of wood holding him up. They can see every angle. He's in the middle of them. And he's appeared in the middle of them. And they'll, they'll be able to see there's no tricks going on there. And then he does something else that dead people don't do. He speaks. There's a phrase, uh, it's as silent as the grave. It's not, it's as chatty as the grave. When I walked back from uni, I used to pass one. I never heard conversations from the graveyard. Why? Because dead people don't speak. But Jesus did. Jesus did. And his words weren't dim down the lights. Stay away from me. They weren't words that tried to um, hide anything. They were words that actually invited investigation, that invited scrutiny, that invited challenge. Because he turns around, and in the translation that I read from, it says, handle me and see. I think it was, touch me and see in the ESV. You see, he invites them to come close. He invites them to see for sure that he is alive, that he has risen. Uh, the disciples' first reaction is actually one that they've had in the past. They think he's a spirit or a ghost. It's something they did when Jesus was walking on the water. When Jesus walked on the water, they said, it's a ghost. And here again, they say, well, it's a ghost. 
because there's no other explanation for how he's talking, how he's moved to the middle of a room in front of us, how he's there, standing there. So they, they assume it's a ghost. But Jesus turns around and tells them uh, that a ghost wouldn't have flesh and, blood, and bones as you see I have. Jesus invites them to touch him, to feel the scars and the hands on his hands, scars on his hands and on his feet. You see, Jesus is patient with them and he gives them more and more evidence. And then he does something else as well. And it's something that seems a bit bizarre to me when I read the passage, but something that meant a lot to at least one of the disciples. You see, finally, Jesus offers to eat with them and he eats a part of a roasted fish and some translations include a bit of honeycomb as well. So he eats a bit of fish with them. That's actually an amazing thing for Peter in particular. That's something that will stick with Peter. He won't be able to get this image out of his head, how the risen Jesus actually ate with him. How someone who had been killed on that cross was able to appear three days later and eat fish with him. We see that in Acts 10, when Peter preaches the gospel, when he expounds the gospel um, in Cornelius' house, he says, him, that's Jesus, God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. You see, Jesus comes and he eats with them as well. So how many evidences were there? Well, just as simple like categories of evidences there. Firstly, he moved, he appeared amongst them and stood in the middle of them. So Jesus could move because that he appeared there amongst them. Secondly, he could talk. Jesus spoke to them. He says, peace to you, and then he invites them to come and look to investigate further. And thirdly, he could eat. And he could do all of these after his death. Why? Because he was no longer dead. He was alive again. He was alive physically. He'd risen from the grave. If there's a pet shop, uh, let's say there's a young woman there who works there. And in this pet shop, as she's working away, her manager comes over to her. And her manager says, I'm afraid in that corner where we keep the mice, in that cage of four mice, one of the mice has died. And I'd like you to take that mouse and deal with that mouse. So the young lady uh, walks over to the cage. She looks inside the cage and her main task, she knows how to deal with the mouse, but her main task is to find which one is the dead mouse. She looks in and one mouse runs into the middle of the cage, stands up on its hind legs and looks around. So that's the first mouse. The second mouse looks in one of those little mirrors and is chattering away in those little mirrors, talking to itself, having a great conversation. The third mouse is trying to gnaw open a peanut shell, manages to do it, gets out a peanut and has a bit of food there. Which is the dead mouse? It's obvious, isn't it? It's the fourth mouse, it's the dead mouse. Because the other, one of the other ones is moving, one of the other ones is talking, one of the other ones is eating. And they're not dead, dead mice don't do that. So it was fairly obvious to decide which one was the dead one. It's the one that's not doing any of those things. I didn't even have to explain what the fourth mouse was like. We know it has to be that one. Jesus Christ didn't just do one of these things. He did all three. He appeared amongst them, in the middle of them. He ate with them and he spoke to them. Jesus Christ did all three of those things. And so we can be confident that Jesus is alive. You see, this is a book we can trust. It's a book written by real men of history, people who actually lived and people who actually died for this, for this message. People won't die for a lie, not if they know it's a lie, and these people would have known. And you know as well, these aren't the type of people that would do that anyway, I, I put to you because of the way that they are at the start of this passage, frightened and hiding in a room. But yet they're willing to die for this message because they know it's true. And do we really know this is true for ourselves as well? Do we know this same change that turned these apostles from men who were hiding in the room to men who were out 
speaking in all the towns they could get to about Jesus? Do we know that same change in our life? Do we know the impact that Jesus risen from the dead should have for us? So be confident Jesus is alive. He reigns. He's risen from the dead. And as a result, when he offers you eternal life, if you're a Christian today, you can have faith that he'll hold, he'll hold to that, that he will do that. Because as he has beaten his grave, when he offers you eternal life, he actually can do it. He has the evidence. He has the proof. Uh, the other religions around the world have leaders who offer life but are still in their tombs. So Muhammad is buried in Medina. Uh, Buddha, one of his two teeth are meant to be in Sri Lanka. Um, we could go around um, all the different, the Mormons, um, Joseph Smith, he's buried as well. You can go to his grave. But Jesus' grave is empty. And so when he offers you eternal life, there's proof, there's evidence that he can deliver. Uh, so look into it and believe it wholeheartedly. The evidence is there. That's just one account. There are countless, there are, well, there are loads of accounts in the New Testament of Jesus Christ risen and meeting people. And in one, in 1 Corinthians 15, where you get a summary of it, he appears to over 500 people. And it's written at a time where those 500 people would still have been alive. So they could have gone and checked up on these people. They could have gone and asked. And these people actually could have even suffered as a result of saying it's true. But Paul says it quite openly, there's 500 people. And they could have gone and checked up on each of those. Why? Because it was true. Jesus did appear to all those people. And he appeared, he appeared to these people as well. So finally, we're going to look at Jesus. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in the evidence. But what if you've came here and your problem isn't a lack of evidence? Your problem is you feel unloved. You feel like you're in a dark place, in a dark time. Well, the Jesus that we see in this passage is an amazing Jesus. And we see him here. Of course he is. And we see him and parts of his character, particularly three points that I want to draw out. So we're going to look at three things that show how amazing Jesus' character is. And firstly, his mercy. You see, Jesus' mercy is here on show when these disciples who'd betrayed him, who'd failed him, who'd ran away from him, one of them had denied him, these very disciples, he arrives in the room, and what's the first words he says to them? Peace. Peace to you. They must have been frightened when they saw Jesus alive. They must have thought, what's he going to do to me? I've, I've just betrayed him. I've just left him and gone and done my own thing. I've avoided him because I didn't want to suffer like he did. But yet he comes to them and he says, peace. Now, to an extent, this is a, a greeting, shalom. It's a local greeting that would have been around at the time. But actually more than that, here, I think it's significant that he uses the word peace when he arrives in that room. Because what he's done is he's came into this world and he's died for those very people who betrayed him. And before we get all uh, looking down on the disciples, actually, we've betrayed God too, haven't we? We've all gone our own way. We've all sinned. We've all chosen to live for ourselves. And yet Jesus comes amongst these people who are just like us, and his first words are peace. You see, the peace that he brings, it's not necessarily, one day it will be, but at that point, he's not telling them there's not going to be any more wars. He's not telling them that there's going to be no pain or suffering in their lives. We know from the futures there will be. But he is saying to them, peace with God. He's brought peace with God. He's won peace with God through the cross and through the resurrection. And so when he comes to them, he's merciful, he's loving. And instead of demanding fire to come down from heaven or consume them or anything like this, what does he say? He says, peace. He says, I've won reconciliation for you. I've won peace for you, peace with God. And they're the first words he brings, words of comfort. He's merciful and kind to them. Peace is a theme throughout Luke. Uh, you can see it from the very start. Uh, in Zechariah, when Jesus is about to be born, Zechariah sings a song. That's John the Baptist's dad. He sings a song, uh, and part of it is um, a prophecy that says that Jesus will give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, and he, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So Jesus will be someone who guides their way into the guides their feet into the way of peace. 
So we see from that start a link of peace to Jesus who's going to come. In Luke 2, also the angels, um, they prophesy. They say, glory to God in the highest and peace, sorry, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So they say as well, Jesus is going to bring peace toward men. And this is what Jesus does. He comes, he lives amongst us, he lives as a human being. God walks on this earth, he shows love to everyone around him. And he goes on to die. Why? So that he can bring you peace with God. So that for those who, like in that blonde in story, trust in him, who rely on the work he did on the cross, not on themselves, they can have peace with God and stand before God. The second point uh, is Jesus' love. And that's seen in one way, in the, that he is constantly giving more and more evidences to the disciples. He's showing them his hands and his feet. He's speaking to them. He's inviting them to come close, to touch and see. He wants them to know that he's risen. He wants them to be sure of it. He's patient with them. He's kind with them. He's loving with them. But Matthew Henry points out uh, an amazing thing, that there'll be another time where Jesus shows his hands and his feet to show the scars in them. Matthew Henry says that it'll be on that final day. You see, on that final day, he'll not be showing his scars to the disciples, to us as believers. He'll not be showing them so that we can believe the truth. We'll know the truth. We're stood in the courtroom of God on that final day. We'll know. We'll know for definite that God exists, that Jesus was, is true. But on that final day, he will show his hands and his scars, but he'll be showing them to God on our behalf. That's how Matthew Henry puts it. That on that final day, when all our sins are read out, when all the things that are wrong are read out in each of our lives, Jesus Christ will be showing, I died for this one. I died, I suffered for this one. Out of love for them. Do you know that for yourself? Do you know that Jesus Christ died for you? Do you know that those scars were for you? That's the love that he has towards us. That's why in the book of Revelations, when I will no longer have any of my scars... In heaven, Jesus will still look like the lamb who was slain. He suffers for us. He loves us. He dies for us. He takes that punishment and he offers us life. And the final thing is Jesus' humility. Uh, this is the most amazing victory that's ever been won in history. Better than a D-Day, better than a Waterloo. Jesus has defeated the grave. And the celebratory meal... What do you think it would be? Well, at the king's coronation, uh, later there's going to be different meals served up. One of them will be, it sounded lovely when I looked it up, it'll be a rack of roasted lamb covered in sesame oil, mustard, soy sauce, roast potato and green salad. Sounds all right. What was the celebratory meal that Jesus had after winning the greatest victory over, over sin, over hell, over death? So that we can say, as we said at the start, where's, where's sin's victory? Where's sin? Oh, sin, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? We can point to a victory here, but what's the meal he has? It's a bit of fish. See, Jesus came down into this world uh, and made himself as one of us. That, that shows his humility. But here, he eats what the disciple has. He doesn't make himself an amazing uh, celebratory meal. Instead, on that Easter Sunday, when he's risen from the dead, we see him eating the fish. What the disciples had to hand. And doesn't that, isn't that a beautiful image of how Jesus is towards us? How his humility towards us, in that he comes down and he lives as one of us. He comes down and he lives as though we, as he was born in a manger, he comes down, he lives a life of poverty, and then he humbles himself even more to the cross. Well, here, even after he's won that victory, he still humbles himself by eating just a fish. A bit of roasted fish is all that is. And that's his celebratory meal that he has with the people who just recently betrayed him. So be confident. Jesus is loving, Jesus is merciful, and Jesus is humble as well. And so you can have confidence when you approach Jesus Christ that he is those three things, loving, humble and merciful so in closing for those who don't yet know this Jesus uh, every one of us will one day sadly 
face our end. There is someone who has been seen that. There is someone whose tomb had, well, made a way out of their own tomb because they rose from the dead. There is someone who you can trust when they say, this is how you can have eternal life. And they say the way, what Jesus says, the way is through repenting and believing. That's turning, turning from how you're living, the way that we all live as humans naturally for ourselves, turning from that, and as the Christian does, seeking to serve God from that point forward. Turning our focus from serving ourselves to serving God, but also believing, trusting in him, like Blondin, with that wheelbarrow, getting in that wheelbarrow, if you like, trusting that he can take you through the fear, through death, into heaven. Not you yourself, but he can do that for you. Do you rely on Jesus? Have you given him your life?